Hey everyone, uh, I am here with Jack Gia from Wire. Uh, he'll be doing a talk on securing your assets across borders. Uh, once he starts talking, can you guys confirm that you can hear him? Awesome, hey guys, can you hear me right? Cool. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I can probably just get started, and if uh, you guys are having a hard time hearing me, please let me know. Um, but yeah, so I'm Jack. I am currently head of partnerships at Wire. Awesome, thank you, Randall. I am going to uh, just port my presentation over now, so you can see the full screen here. Um, yeah, so you know, today we're going to be talking about securing assets across border using crypto as a rail. Uh, I think it's a very fitting conversation for. Uh, today's topic in regards to self-sovereignty and privacy, you know, obviously in, in doomsday scenarios, uh, there's a few assumptions we're making here, obviously, you know, as far as uh, the fragility of the financial institution as is, and perhaps even governance as, you know, as far as like nation states and all that. So, you know, I, I think um, it, it, there's some speculative kind of uh, uh, propositions we're making here on how best to secure your assets. But uh, I, I just wanted to uh, help us to look at the landscape, right, of where things stand as far as how do you acquire different cryptos and where should you store it from, from a user perspective, but also mm -hmm. just looking at the landscape in terms of our industry. Um, yeah, so just a little background about Wire. Uh, we've been in the industry since 2013. Over the years, we've done a lot of different things, uh, crypto merchant processing, e-wallets, via on and off ramps. And you know, over the years, we basically combine everything into one API to offer different developers, so that you can onboard your users, uh, attach like the, a payment method such as wire transfers or uh, cards or ACH, and then allow them to basically pay in and convert to crypto. And also the other way around, where we help different merchants to convert crypto back to fiat. So yeah, so you know, we, we have a number of solutions at Wire here. Uh, it, it's very concentrated around security and compliance. Right, because uh, it, at the end of the day, we are uh, we are operating sort of as a custodial wallet. Where we are hosting different private keys on our side to make it easier for developers to interact with an API. So you know, compliance and security is very important. Um, and yeah, you can kind of visualize our solutions basically as one API. Right, um, you get to basically create an account for a user, pass in their KYC AML, attach a payment method. Uh, go from US dollar to Bitcoin, for example, and then Bitcoin back to US dollar. We've aggregated all the liquidity across different exchanges into one API so that you can do those conversions um, in one API. Uh, Wire is also globally regulated. We are a money transmitter in the US. Uh, we are also registered with Austrac in Australia. We're MSO in Hong Kong, a money service operator in Hong Kong. And a number of other jurisdictions where we operate, we are partnered with uh, licensed local partners. So yeah, so you know, it, kind of been in the industry for these past six years. A lot of things have happened, obviously, um, but you know, I think you know, cross-border payments is definitely something that is dear to our hearts because we we started kind of seeing traction there uh, in 2016, and actually got an investment from a Chinese bank that helped us with uh, Chinese U.S. dollar to Chinese yuan payments, and that was a really good rail for us. Um, but yeah, you know, so. And just taking taking a step back, our goal here at Wire is basically to make the lives of uh, different developers easier that are fintech entrepreneurs. Um, it's it's a hard business to be in because there are high barriers to entry. You do have to get different licenses even before you start operating. And uh, you know, I think with the banking as service uh, kind of becoming more commodified is making that a lot easier, which is a good thing. So yeah, so you know, definitely. Uh, hit me up afterwards if you are a developer and are building anything. Uh, you can check out Casa's new Bitcoin wallet. They actually use our Apple Pay to BTC function on the back end. Uh, and this is something that we're looking to support for many different types of wallets and industry partners out there. Cool. So um, now I got that out of the way, <laughs> let's, let's jump into today's presentation. So, you know, securing your assets across borders, right? So what are we talking about here when we talk about your assets, right? It's a lot of different things and uh, all of it is pretty much built on the incumbent financial institutions. So, you know, today I wanted to focus more on money because, you know, it'll take more time for different uh, real world assets to be brought on chain in the form of different tokens, 
we're seeing this in decentralized finance space in Ethereum, obviously with uh, synthetics and other kind of um, uh, tokens that can represent securities and commodities. Uh, there's a number of different real estate uh, backed kind of tokens, uh, security tokens out there. And yeah, so I think that that's a little bit early as far as just bringing those more real world assets on chain. It'll happen eventually. But right now, when we talk about crypto, um, it's pretty much just money, right? It's the movement of money and the securing of money. And how do you basically secure your assets first by moving all your assets into crypto? Um, so, so really what we're talking about is trade, settlement and custody. Right. So if you think about, you know, maybe in a few years when you can actually self custody your own security tokens, uh, you can do that now at, at a very low extent as far as market penetration goes. But, but once again, we're, we're really just talking about taking your assets, converting to different crypto that you are comfortable with in terms of your risk profile, uh, having different counterparties settle that to you and then being able to custody it. Yeah. So, you know, Thinking thinking about that again, right? So so what is money, right? And, and how do and more importantly, how is money implemented at various uh, levels uh, in this kind of world macro superstructure for for finance, right? So you know obviously we have Bitcoin, which is completely decentralized and is an object in and of itself that um, that you can own. Uh, and then all the way on the other side, we also have kind of these more private government backed payment rails that are fully centralized, right? And you also have the Alipay's and the WeChat pays where Facebook payments or Venmo's that are uh, equally centralized, but it's a private business as opposed to governments. So, you know, there's so many different types of money that are, that currently uh, is what we use every day, whether it's our cards, whether you wrap that card into your Apple Pay, whether you add it to your Venmo. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, there's such a wide spectrum. So. You know, I like to think about it in terms of kind of this spectrum right here, and we're just going to be covering the middle gut here as far as the uh, uh, the the ones in blue. But but if you think about kind of uh, the spectrum of where uh, we currently are, you know, with our local banking rails backed by the government versus many different kind of incumbent payment networks such as Visa, Master, or Swift network for for global payments, right? Or these kind of new super apps, right? Like WeChat and Facebook, where you know, they have billions of users and they literally just created their own payment rail within network in their own closed loop network centralized. And uh, there's some efficiencies in that, but you know, we're not gonna talk about these kind of incumbents today, um, nor are we gonna talk about kind of the dark web or uh, online fraud where people, you know, let's say buy like a thousand credit cards to try to scam uh, crypto from various uh, venues. Uh, we're, we're just talking about, you know, how do you secure your assets across borders, kind of using these, um, I guess, these green-lighted happy path kind of uh, rails. So, yeah, so, you know, take into the first kind of um, bucket we have here as far as bank coins and central bank coins. And this is something that uh, is happening. And it's, it's, you know, for what it's worth, it's pretty exciting to see, right? I think China is making... Uh, huge waves right now and moving pretty fast in this direction. Uh, obviously, I think it was like a year ago or something that JP Morgan came out with their own uh, kind of pen token. Um, and, and, you know, I, th I think from the incumbent side of the world, there, there's a lot of movement in that sense, right? So, so there's uh, pressure. I think Congress just introduced like 30 new bills in relation to crypto or blockchain uh, in, this, in this past year. And it's very, very awesome to see you know, just governments getting involved, but it's probably a long way to go before this actually happens. And and the value that it brings to uh, kind of this doomsday scenario is limited, obviously, right? Because uh, it's actually probably like a nightmare to have the People's Bank of China control all the different payments and the token itself and being able to literally burn and mint money uh, for different political purposes. So. You know, for what it's worth, this is happening, but uh, it's probably irrelevant for actually securing your assets. Um, on, on the, you know, on the incumbent side, though, but I think there is a lot of innovation that is happening. So if we look at uh, various trusts and existing banks, uh, such as Silvergate and you know Prime Trust or you know Paxos Trust, Gemini Trust, uh, there's a good amount of innovation happening there, and they are also building their their own networks, uh, so that you know it's. 
you can you can see here it's pretty much a closed loop network as well. However, it's uh, a lot of the counterparties on these networks are within our industry, right? So, so it makes sense to to do this, and it's good to see you know banks uh, being able to custody crypto or trust being able to custody crypto, and also having these internal settlement networks for crypto. So that's that's good activity. But you know, just zooming out even more, you know, we 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 have within the cross border payment space a lot of different uh, players for sure, especially on a regional basis. Right, so if you look at Southeast Asia or recently Nigeria, uh, Latin America, obviously with you know Argentina and hyperinflation, uh, different political instability in Venezuela, uh, these are all different areas where you start seeing local players pop up who do exactly uh, what is needed you know, as far as the capital restrictive or hyper hyperinflation that's happening in those countries and needing to secure your assets using crypto. Uh, lots of pesos being converted to bitcoin here so it, it, it makes sense to do that there's there's many ways to do it so you know on the institutional side uh it's, it's probably a little bit irrelevant for most of us here unless we wanted to you know create like a trust account um and, and that's a good thing actually i think uh you know trust in america are probably one of the safest places to park your money in terms of privacy and security uh, of course that's dependent upon that institution not uh, defaulting or failing, uh, but just in terms of the land of the law here in America, I think it's good, literally the best, probably to park your money out of trust. But um, yeah, you know, there, there there is a good amount of different payment rails that are popping up around crypto and Bitcoin um, to to basically solve this very problem. So you know, so one of the uh, kind of old school. Uh, comparisons we can make here is Ripple versus Stellar. On the left here, we have Ripple, and the right here, we have Stellar. Uh, and I just took this from their website, and you can also see that they speak very different languages. Um, you know, Ripple, I think, you know, is definitely working closely with the incumbent financial institutions, different banks, to effectively replace the SWIFT network uh, and, and allow different cross-border payments to travel through their rails or right, using Ripple Nets. Uh, and there's a good amount of success that they're seeing in uh, Southeast Asia through SBI remits. Uh, SBI Holdings uh, holds a good amount of XRP, I believe, and uh, there's good business that's happening there for cross-border settlements using Ripple. Uh, and, and Stellar, you know, takes a different approach. The, they've tokenized different local currency on chain, and you're able to become an anchor as a money services business in order to basically serve as a fiat on and off ramp for the Stellar network. And, and this makes a lot of sense too. Uh, it's it's a fairly more decentralized kind of approach to kind of work with MSBs as opposed to you know, just powering uh, kind of inner ledger transfers between banks. Um, but, but yeah, this is kind of the classic uh, example for cross-border payments is Ripple versus Stellar. Uh, you do have new players on the scene, obviously. Uh, the super apps like WeChat, Libra, um, obviously with Facebook which has 5 billion users, and there's a good amount of uh, cross-border payments that can happen. Uh, and, and Celo as well, kind of being mobile first and, and focusing on remittance in, in, in countries that are kind of unbanked, right? These, this is the same kind of proposition or value proposition that, that every single cross-border payments uh, crypto company has basically uh, told all of us, which is, you know, the problem that's being solved here has a lot to do with being able to move money uh, across borders in, in a very simple manner. And uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Libra, uh, I think, uh, in this next few months, a uh, good amount of activity that they can do. Uh, I, I personally already use Facebook payments, and it's, you know I can see how WhatsApp and Facebook can just kind of clean up shop. But uh, you know that's definitely something to wait and see. Um, yeah, so then, you know, looking at another side of the spectrum for how you might be able to uh, get your crypto locally uh, and, and secure it across borders is just going through a peer-to-peer -peer exchange for ATMs, right? And in the same way as Stellar, you can think of these as anchors, right? There's many different ATMs all across the world where you can buy and sell uh, Bitcoin. And, and through that, you can literally, you know, go to one ATM, uh, deposit a hundred local hundred dollars local currency, right, and then send to buy the Bitcoin and send it to uh, someone else in another country who can then cash that Bitcoin out at another ATM, 
um, into local currency in that country, right? So there's a lot of good kind of activity that can happen here. This is more retail, obviously, but um, it, it's definitely become very, very vibrant. You know, Paxful and CoinMe have been growing very fast. I just took these screenshots from CoinMe.com and Paxful, but uh, you know, it's it, it's a very kind of elegant solution, and, and this is happening all around the world, right? And in China through CoinCola, in Nigeria, in uh, obviously in Argentina and, and Colombia, Venezuela, all the other kind of capital restricted countries in Latin America. Um, so, so this is happening very organically, these P2, uh, P2P exchanges. Uh, and, and the flow is very simple, right? If you think about user one sending to user two, uh, there's, an, there's Bitcoin that's sent into an escrow and user two gets to basically send the local currency to user one and then basically the peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange will release the Bitcoin to user two. So you know, this, there's a lot of activity happening here through these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And uh, yeah, it, it's a good way to, you know, just convert all your assets into crypto. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention has to do with MSBs. So money services businesses and local brokerages, right? So uh, oftentimes all the different regional players they are still subject to local law and uh, you know they're running a brokerage and um, but for the purpose of remittance we're converting crypto to local currency um, and it, it is not easy because you know regulation is still kind of uh, developing in different countries right I, I think one of the best use cases or one of the most successful use cases is bloom solutions in the philippines where you know they, they work closely with the central bank philippines they're licensed there locally to do um, basically uh, uh, PHP to BTC, right? So Filipino pesos to BTC and vice versa. And, and you know, I, I really have a lot of respect for what Bloom is doing. Uh, it's and this is happening not just you know in the Philippines. Once again, you know, Bit, BitX, uh, BitX LA, which is based in uh, Argentina, uh, they also have very similar operation running a local brokerage to allow local currency to be converted to BTC. You know, so, so the trade and the settlement aspect of how you can get uh, crypto or Bitcoin through local currency, there, there's so many different facets now. It's, it's not like uh, before. Yeah, so, so you know, once again, kind of looking at the regional liquidity um, that's been uh, definitely grown recently. You know, we see, you know, Philippines, uh, Latin America, in, in Africa, and, and obviously for B2B payments, there's a lot of US and China still happening. Uh, so, you know, Tether is used, uh, the, the stablecoin Tether is being used in China and Russia and various Southeast Asian countries, not just for trading or for miners, but actually for commerce, right? Using Tether or Bitcoin to settle different uh, international invoices. This is uh, a, a huge use case. Uh, as to why there's such a huge kind of local OTC market in, in China. Well, yeah, so so shifting gears a little bit, we just went through, you know, kind of what I consider to be trade and settlements, which is how do you acquire crypto? Who do you get it from, from which venues, right? And then we come to this idea for custody. You know, after you buy, you hold. Well, where do you hold? And, and how do you securely hold? And do you trust different institutions to hold the crypto for you? or do you trust yourself to hold it? Uh, in, in the traditional sense, that might sound pretty insane because no one wants to have like a stock certificate in, under their bed. That's just not secure. There's a reason why banks exist for custody uh, and, and different kind of regulatory recourse that comes with storing funds, uh, you know, with a regulated financial institution. Um, but, but, you know, in, in, as we approach, you know, times like these right now where you know, literally, I'm sitting in East Bay, California, and there's a fire around me, and the smoke is getting thicker and thicker, and things can go crazy uh, and go south real quick. <laughs> so, so you know, we, we'll also talk about self custody here. How do you do that? Um, how do how do you hold your own crypto without relying on a third party? But yeah, so just going over custodial wallets first. There's definitely a lot out there. Uh, many different exchange wallets. Uh, you know, no, everyone says to not keep your funds on an exchange. And uh, you know it, that really depends on what type of exchange and if they're regulated, right? So if you're if you're holding funds on Coinbase or Gemini, I would say you're doing pretty okay because you know there's they're, they're based in North America, they're licensed money transmitters, they have surety bonds with each state, so that in the case of a doomsday scenario, they're able to get 
uh, something back for their users, right? They have uh, insurance, uh, you know, and their SOC 1 or SOC 2 audited, which is, you know, just uh, basically from a regulatory standpoint, there is recourse uh, when you're storing funds on certain centralized exchanges that are regulated, right? And, and same thing with different trusts. You know, it's once again, if you take a step back and you think about what a trust is, uh, and the fact that uh, local state laws, especially in Nevada, are uh, very protective of your assets and privacy. I, I think there's strong arguments to be made for kind of centralized custodial wallets. The, the nuance there is, once again, is that is the centralized custodial wallet regulated or, or not, right? You might hold funds on another centralized exchange that's run in a very opaque manner in terms of compliance and, uh, you know, and their licensing structure is not very clear and there's not a clear path to regulatory recourse. And, uh, and even though, you know, they're also centralized, I, I wouldn't hold funds on there. But, uh, you know, I think with, with, you know, with at least North American licensed money transmitters, it makes sense to me, or, or, or trusts in America, uh, I think it makes sense to, to hold funds in a custodial manner. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, we, we also have many non-custodial wallets. I grabbed this from Wire's website. These are some of our partners that we power. Uh, different non-custodial wallets and DeFi protocols, but uh, you know, and this is the kind of whole idea of, you know, storing your own crypto um, and, and facing a different set of risks when it comes to, you know, what what are you doing with your private keys? Is it just on your phone? Do you use some kind of multi-sig uh, structure for for you know, for example, Casa Bitcoin Wallet has a way for you to hook up your Trezor and your Ledger into like a master key. Uh, and, and, you know, do you distribute it throughout physical space? You know, so, so there's a lot of that kind of like, you know, meat space considerations. But in, in terms of the different type of wallets out there that, that are, that are non-custodial, there's a good amount uh, that you can, there's, there's different types you can use, right? You know, whether it's hardware wallets, whether it's you know, Android or iOS apps that, are, that, that allow you to hold your own keys, whether there, there are smart contract wallets on Ethereum where, you know, it's still kind of your own keys, even though you're kind of trusting uh, the master smart contract holder to, to show some good faith. So, so, so there's different considerations in non-custodial wallets, I think, as far as uh, just making sure you're using a reputable wallet and, you know, you're, you're holding your own keys. And, and if you interact with any smart contracts, just know that, you know, that's as much a risk that you're taking as when you go through any centralized channels, right? It, it, there's different set of risks, but yeah, you know, <laughs> and some of those risks compound, right? So, so just kind of going over what's happening in DeFi, right? You can hold your own crypto in your own non-custodial wallet, but if you interact with a smart contract to take out some yield through decentralized finance, uh, effectively operating a non-custodial interest-bearing accounts, it, just, just be aware that you're you're not actually uh, holding your own funds and your funds are actually locked into a smart contract and you're subject to some of the smart contract risks uh, that are involved, right? So, so you know, once again, depending on your risk profile and how much risk you're willing to take when securing your assets, uh, DeFi is uh, either a good place to go or a bad place. Uh, I, I don't have too much funds on DeFi. I use a few protocols to experiment. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely this kind of new... Uh, new ecosystem that's been birthed in this past few years, right? You know, we're, we're, we're really talking about alternative lending facilities, which is, you know, tr traditionally you might have the SOFIs and the lending clubs that are underwriting loans. It, it needs to take a lot of KYC and information about you, uh, to, uh, you know, your, your, your credit risk score and all these different things. Uh, and, and when we do that on chain, obviously we don't have a lot of the, uh, the real life data to underwrite these loans. And most of the loans are over collateralized in order to draw down uh, some sort of stable coin or fiat money. And, and that's kind of where the yield is coming from. Uh, so, so, you know, just taking a step back, whether it's centralized or decentralized, just know that the yield is coming from uh, effectively what are traders who are going long and short on crypto. So, so the, the business model there is really important to understand, right? Whether, whether it's centralized or decentralized. Uh, there's a good amount of different risks when you're parking your funds on these different platforms. So yeah, so this last slide here, I grabbed it from uh, one of the blogs that Wire put out a few weeks ago. 
this is kind of you know how we think about risk when it comes to storing assets, right? So so why are we we run our own wallets? We we're we're money transmitter and we have our own hosted wallet architecture, uh, and, and so in, in a way we're serving as a custodian as well. And uh, you know recently we came out with a savings API where we allow different users to store funds and earn interest on the funds that they store. So you know on the back end, you know we're we're using a number of providers uh, such as you know Maker and Compound or on the centralized side of the world, such as BlockFi, right? And, and we're really aggregating these different um, providers. And, and so, so in this blog, you know, we, we wanted to help the community to understand how we see uh, kind of uh, risk, right? A counterparty risk. It, it really comes down to counterparty risk and security. You know, when we're trading, uh, it, when you go through Wires API to book a USD BTC trade, that order is routed in this kind of prime brokerage manner to different exchanges, but we don't use every exchange. And how we consider which exchange to add to our API on the back end is kind of how we considered how to add these kind of lending facilities to our back end as well through the savings API. So, you know, regulatory recourse and cryptographic recourse, you know, is is this protocol, has this protocol been around long enough for it to be, uh, you know, kind of many eyeballs on it, it's open source and the different, uh, you know, the different community members are looking at this co contract, right? And it's important to have uh, many eyeballs on it to, to have these third-party audits. And it's a different form of audit. Obviously, it's a technical audit, and it's not a regulated audit by the state. But, you know, th this is this is what you're looking at when you think about, uh, you know, where you're storing your funds, whether it was a light, whether with the qualified custodian or in this non-custodial manner by yourself, and, and to understand the underlying technology behind it. Um, so yeah, so so this is a little bit of a show on uh, uh, recent updates at Wire. We're offering the uh, Wire Savings API to our partners to earn interest in their accounts, and you can get started basically by creating an account at Wire and then generate API keys to to spin up these savings savings wallets. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. And I think I can take some questions. Cool. Here's the question here. What function does Wire work to include in non-custodial wallets? Yeah. So, you know, Wire, we have um, an API doc that allows non-custodial wallets to effectively onboard their users, right? So you can create an account for a user, pass in their KYC AML, right? And you can also then attach a payment method such as a debit card or credit card or ACH, right? So a non-custodial wallet can effectively um, take users KYC and allow them to use their payment method to buy Bitcoin, for example. And which are the ways or strategies to have BTC financial services reach mainstream market? This is a good question. I mean, it's happening from all facets, right? So if you think about, you know, uh, kind of Paxos working with Robinhood, well, now all Robinhood users can buy crypto. Or sorry, Revolut, Revolut, right? So, so there's from the incumbent side of things, as far as like PayPal getting into crypto, Visa has a strong program where they're getting all the different crypto companies on their prepaid debit card. Right, so the incumbents are making moves um, to blockchainify the world, and obviously that makes um, the it makes crypto rails more compatible with Bitcoin rails as opposed to traditional financial rails. Uh, traditional financial institutional rails for payments is uh, necessarily incompatible with crypto rails, and you have to. Kind of create something like a wire to combine the two, right? Because one is heavily regulated; it just speaks a different language, right? One is, you know, BIP or ERC standard, and it's uh, just different different standards and protocols to the network. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're all moving at a pretty good pace. You know, on, on the institutional side, you have Grayscale, uh, Grayscale trusts, and a lot of Bitcoins being held there. Uh, there's good, healthy LTC activity. Uh, exchange liquidity is going up. You know, retail as far as Cash App or Revolut is going to be very helpful. Um, and yeah, cool. Uh, cool. This is really great. We're going to transition now to our next talk. Sweet. Awesome.